How's it going everyone? Lovely to have you back. So in this video I want to go through the homecoming reveal trailer, all of it, and look at every single piece and talk about every single thing that I can think to analyze. Okay, now Reddit's done a great job of listing, I think, all the things that this reveal trailer shows. Um, but if you don't want to read loads of uh, pages of that particular thing, I'm hoping this video will be quite educational because I'll be elaborating on some mechanics and some ideas and referencing the CD Projekt Red and why they've done it. So hopefully things are a little easier to understand in that respect. But also I'll be linking it back to mechanics and um, systems like provisions and initiative and sort of connecting the two. Okay. So first of all, we've got the mulligan screen here. And the first thing I want to talk about is the mulligans. So the mulligans, in this case, we've got five, which is more than we have now in our current version. And apparently these are tied to your leader. So your leader is not only a, a thing, a card or a being that has a power, but it also has the initiative tied to it. And it also has mulligans tied to it. And they said that maybe the stronger your leader, the less mulligans you would get. So wooden spirit in this case gets five. Uh, they did also say coin flip based, so you may get one or two more mulligans uh, if you have to go first. Okay, now this brings us back a little bit onto one of the worries that we had, which was reliability, because now decks need to be 30 units in size, maximum, minimum, up from 25 in the current Gwent. Uh, there's less tutors in general, and also you can only have two of each copy of bronze in a deck now. So um, we were worried about um, the reliability of actually getting through your debt, but it seems like one of the ways they're trying to counter this is by giving us more mulligans. We're getting five here. I think we get like three in round two, and I think again another three in round three. Uh, to coincide with this, we're also getting more draws. So in round two, I think it's confirmed that we're getting three draws, and in round three, I think we're also drawing another three cards. So I think this is the way they're going to try and... Uh, focus on that reliability. We will still have some tutors, but more mulligans, more draws to get through your deck and sort of try and work that out. So if we have a quick look here, um, because this is the mulligan screen, he's going to be mulliganing some cards here. Okay. And they go to the side to the right there, as you can see. And in this sense, again, they're trying to help uh, reliability. They're trying to get rid of the mulligan bug here because what they're doing is at the minute when you mulligan a card it blacklists and it puts it back into the deck straight away okay so let's say i mulliganed um this archer spore it will put it straight back into the deck and then when i mulligan other things if that card was put at the top then it's going to stay at the top if it was put at the bottom it's going to stay at the bottom but if it puts anywhere near the top when i mulligan the other cards i'm, I'm sort of taking them from the top and it gets pushed up so the mulligan bug is like confirmation bias of you putting cards back and if they're anywhere near the top, you keep drawing cards due to the mulligan and it kind of appears on the top coincidentally a lot more often. Uh, whereas what's happening here is they're all putting them to the side rather than putting them back in the deck straight away. And they'll only get shuffled back into the deck when he decides to finish his redraws, his mulligans. Um, so... Although they get shuffled into the deck at the end, it is random. Now, it can go straight to the top of the deck again, or it can go to the bottom, or it could go anywhere in between. But it means that it's less likely to be at the top because you're not putting it back straight away and then sort of forcing it upwards by drawing more cards um, as you go. Okay, so this is a way of trying to fix the mulligan bug. And now, it is worth mentioning at this point that we don't know whether blacklisting is going to be in the game. There's no evidence that it's not in the game. Like, I've looked through, there's no point where he mulligans a werewolf and then draws another werewolf, uh, even though he's mulliganed it. So there's no evidence that blacklist is in, is in the game. And Pavel has said it could be. He doesn't quite know yet. So that's something we have to sort of look at. Now, if we go back a little bit, we've got some units with cards. Uh, cards with with abilities, should I say? And uh, I'm not going to go over too much. I, I I probably will, to be fair. But you can see the cards and their abilities on um, Imga. If they're important, I'll probably mention them. For example, we're going to start with the Rot Fiend here. Uh, it's got its name, and then it's got its tags or its uh, categories. I think they might be referencing it now. And notice this one's in blue. This is what we're going to call our primary category, and we'll get onto that later. 
Okay, so this one seems to have a passive ongoing ability. Whenever another unit dies, deal one damage. And that's that's a type of card. It's an ongoing ability. You don't have to trigger it yourself. You know, it's not activatable. It just happens. It's an ongoing ability. Okay. Now, if we um, have a look at the next card, we've got the Griffin. Okay, and we can see the Griffin over here as well, but we can see its ability. It is a special card. Any card with a flame icon is a special card this in this case it's organic and it works kind of like princess Pavetta and epidemic sort of put together okay um at this point i would say i think a lot of these cards are just placeholders i mean a griffin spell doesn't make much sense uh wild Hunt navigator later on we'll see doesn't make much sense a lot of the thematic stuff doesn't make much sense like imarif doing a fireball um so i'd say a lot of these is placeholder they didn't really want to show us uh the cards they were just showing us the look of the cards the ui the board and activatable abilities which is really what this was about so i think these are just kind of placeholders it's roughly right but you know some of the values are also wrong um we're going to keep going here we can now see obviously these are unit cards as well if we just um go back there a second so we've got special cards and unit cards and we have golds and bronzes so this is a gold here because it's got a gold sort of border and a gold embellish and this is a bronze because it's got like a bronze border and a bronze embellish now one of the issues is they're pretty hard to differentiate uh, this video the uh, homecoming was recorded several weeks ago before we got to see it so they've already said that this has been fixed the hard to differentiate gold and bronze has already been fixed and there are a lot of comments on reddit so they're well aware of it and apparently it's been fixed already okay so it's worth noting now because you can see bronze and you can see gold on the screen that there are no more silvers in the game whatsoever. Um, all silvers have now been promoted to gold or demoted, which most of them have been promoted that we've seen. Um, most of them in the game have been promoted to Cordon Pavel, but you know one of them is going to like a uh, little wild boar of the meme or something is going to be a bronze and it's going to be like, what did you do to deserve this? Okay, so... We can look straight up now. Actually, let's talk about these uh, little little gems here. These are the rarities of cards. Um, so we've got common, rare, legendary there. We don't have an epic on the board right now. Um, but a lot of the silvers have increased to just epic golds. Okay, so you've got legendary golds, you've got epic golds, and I think um, common and rare bronzes. Okay, so they're differentiation based on rarity. And maybe power level. Um, before I go into provisions, which is what I was naturally going to go into there, let me talk about um, something that I wanted to talk about there. I want to quell any worries people have about losing all their silvers. Now, this goes back to uh, what's going to happen in Homecoming. We're going to lose our entire collections, okay? And then we're going to get full scrap value for that, uh, premiums as well. And then we'll get all the starter cards, including some new leaders. And then we can obtain all the leaders from challenges. Uh, any silvers, someone asked me, uh, should I craft loads of silvers then? Because they're going to turn to golds. And that's not the case. Silvers are all epic. And when you when they get transferred to here, they'll just be epic golds rather than legendary golds. So the crafting cost of a silver now and a epic gold will be the same. So you're not going to lose. You're not going to gain anything. In fact, if you're a completely new player and you're watching this video, what you should be doing is try to get the leaders first. Make sure you go through all the challenges and grab those leaders because they are going to be free money because um, any leaders will be exchanged for full scrap value. You'll get some free leaders for the starter decks and then all the leaders you'll be able to get through challenges. So any leaders you have now are free scrap that you'll have later on to convert them into... Uh, value so uh, make sure you get those leaders right let's run on back here a little bit i was talking about the rarities okay and uh provisions i'm going to talk about now um the game we know has a 30 card deck size right and we also know that there's only bronze and golds in the game and we also know that you get provisions to build a deck okay Are you with me um Basically, it doesn't make sense that golds cost 300 and bronzes cost 50, okay, but you need 30 cards. That doesn't make sense. 
all golds cost 300 and all bronzes cost 50. Because then there's no leeway. It means you have to have seven bronzes and, you know, 23... No, seven golds and 23 bronzes. There's no leeway. Um, because if they say, my math is completely off, but if you've got a thousand uh, provisions, there's a set number. You have to get 30 cards. So there's no there's no leeway. You can't lower down a gold and put more bronzes. You can't lower more bronzes and put more golds in because you've got to reach that 30 limit and you've only got a thousand provisions. So it doesn't make sense that golds will cost the same provision wise. So it makes sense in this case that rare, epic, legendary, and uncommon, they're going to cost different amounts of provisions. We don't know this for certain, but it makes sense. And this allows you to lower legendary golds to maybe have more golds in general because you can have more epic golds. Uh, you can lower your rare bronzes and have more legendary golds. You can lower, you know, your epics and get more commons or something like that. So um, it makes sense. And I really think this is how it's going to work, that the provisions is based upon the rarity cost. OK, and that's how decks are going to be a little bit more malleable, and a little bit more flexible when you're playing with them. So we haven't progressed very far, but this is all basic stuff that I really wanted to talk about that we can see from a lot of this. Uh, we're going to start moving at a bit more of a pace now. Um, we can see the werewolf here. He, his, he has the ability to be immune and has the primary category of beast. It also has a little icon down here, which is the... Um, it looks like a mutagen icon. Now, there's two theories. One is that it's an equipable slot, like you can put artifacts in there or something, but I don't think so. There's no real evidence for that. I reckon it's just the immunity icon. And why would immunity need an icon? Because it needs to be on the board and so you can see it because it is a card. It is an ability that makes people make mistakes. Um, if there's a card on the board and it doesn't have any in the way to show that it's immune, then you're probably going to place a card and try and hit it. But this way it shows it on the card when it's on the board, it's immune and you'll try not to hit it, hopefully. OK, so let's keep going through. We've got the Archer Spore here. So we've got different types of. Uh, abilities here we had a passive earlier we had special um and now we've got a deploy so deploy cards are still in effect and we also have death wish here okay you'll see the average value of bronzes is quite low the artist boy is worth about seven if it dies the werewolf is worth about five you know so the average value of bronzes has gone down uh, the average volume average value of a gold it seems to be about 11 um like I said, I think some of these numbers are a little off, but we've got a Wild Hunt Navigator. Again, his primary category is Blue, which is Wild Hunt, and a secondary category is Mage. And he boosts all Death Wish units in hand, the deployability again. So he's talking about the Mulligan, how that's going to work. Geralt is just a base strength 11, does nothing. Okay, we've got some more cards here. We're going to be able to see some different abilities. So Ogroid uh, Cyclops. Deploy, destroy an ally, damage an enemy by the power. Same thing, but just less value in general. Um, we've got Vran. Now, the Vran is a unique card here. It has a icon here with a ZZZ. And uh, this means that it's got the order abilities. You can see here, order. Now, if you're an OG Gwenta like me, order meant something different. Uh, but in this game, order is basically it's an activatable ability. So... This icon means it's got an activatable ability, just like the Barbagatsi. Okay, and so when you activate this card, remove all boost from self and damage a unit by that amount. It also has the Thrive ability. We don't know what that is yet, but I would wager, and I'm going to wager my, um, I don't know, something, something important, my next cup of tea on it, um, that, that means that it boosts itself by one each turn. Um, because I feel like this card should be a bit self-sufficient, um, you remove all buffs, so it should probably boost itself by one each turn, is what I reckon it'll do, so that it's a, a little self-sufficient and it can use its order. But this is an example of a card where you put it on the board, you've got to you've got to take care of it, and you've got to nurture it, and then then you've got to use its order later on down the line. So probably a risky card, probably not a very good card in my opinion, but uh, it's a card which is different to most of the others so far that we've seen. See very well. So we've got a Doppler, and this is where the primary category comes in. It's got a deployability to copy a unit's primary category, which is the blue one. 
um, which I really like. It's a neutral card. You can tell whether what kind of card it is from the tooltip that pops up over here. This one is neutral, and it is truly a neutral, neutral card because you know it allows you to put it in any deck like dwarves, elves, beasts, draconids, relics, or whatever. Providing there's some synergy there, it's a really nice card. But we don't know what kind of extent that has yet. Okay, we've seen a new gold card, Geralt Professional, and this is an unusual one as well. Um, he's got a deployability to damage an enemy by three, which is pretty rubbish. But if the power of that is a multiple of three, three, six, nine, twelve, etc., you destroy it instead. And it's got a reach of two. We're going to get to reach later on towards the end of the video because um, it's demonstrated there, but it's a really cool ability. Um, but that's a really interesting one because that can be quite powerful. You've got a 12 strength unit on the board. He just he's worth loads considering the average value is lowered. So he could be really powerful if there's things that can buff by one. Because a lot of these are five uh, straight away, you know, an eight. So there's a lot of things that could be a multiple of three quite easily with one buff. Skirting around the outside. Throw MLG. Arch Griffin, deploy, consume an ally on a row or else destroy this unit. So it's higher than average, but it's got a pretty dangerous ability that if you can't consume an ally, really bad top deck for the over average bronze. Although some of these numbers are seemingly more powerful. I believe uh, Ekimara is pretty OP at the minute. Right, uh, hopefully I'm not covering up too much here. I'll try and go down here. All I'm covering up down here is uh, the stuff that's at the top here as well. So. I'll describe it at the top. We've got the hand size. Now, this is really important. There's a maximum hand size of 10. Uh, this is to stop dry passing uh, immediately in round one or after a very short round one, dry passing in round two. Um, if you've got less than seven cards, because you draw three cards in round two and three cards in round three, you, you know, you've got to be less than seven cards in order to, uh, actually seven cards or less in order to not go into this. If someone does drive past you because they've got a great hand and they want to extend that, then you can play down to seven cards and not lose any card advantage due to that. If you draw a card, we believe that you discard it. Discard pile is here and here, and this is your deck. Okay, so maximum 10 cards. Your leaders, I believe, still will have abilities, but your leaders are represented as uh, 3D models on the board. Okay, and they will, like your leader will follow your mouse. We'll see that later. And they will taunt each other when the game's over. The, uh, the the values are here, and they're not lined up with the board. This is a complaint people have as well. So again, obviously we've only got two rows, so um, we we'll get to see some really nice things about how two rows is actually quite useful later on. So the Barbagazzi has an order. You can tell by the little icon here, and it consumes a unit. It has two charges. So orders have different types of things. Now the Fran didn't say anything, so maybe you can only use it once. I would imagine that's the case, or you can use it as many times as you want each round. This has two charges, so you can only use it twice. We don't know if you can use it twice in one particular turn. And then we'll see Imler of Sabbath later, who has a cooldown on his. He can use it every other turn, I think. Okay. And then we have Geralt Igni, which again, he is quite powerful because he does what he normally does, but with a row of 15. Um, but with everything down to about five. That's not many cards on a row. We've only got two rows. So he'll most likely always get value at this particular thing. Now he has a reach of two. And again, we'll discuss reach when we get to that particular section. So we can see the hand size, of course, the rank and the title and the name. You can't see the name up here because I think he's facing a bot. There was proof earlier that we're playing slot machine Gwent. And what I mean by that is that you can see the opponent hover over cards. Uh, if we just go back, here we go, Slot Machine Gwent. If you look at the opponent's uh, deck up there, he's playing some slot machines there with a nice light. So some people say that the leaders are not particularly well done. At the minute, they're, they, they pop from the board a little bit. I think it's something to do with Shadow. Okay, so we've got some different cards here. Barbagazzi still, all of these. We've got Clear Sky. Now, Clear Sky, I believe, is here. Now, Clear Sky is a bronze neutral, and uh, clears all hazards from your side. Weather is only one side, so it's not both sides. But this is just a card. It's not first light. It doesn't give you the rally option at the minute. So this would indicate they've gone back to the original Clear Skies, which was very difficult to put in decks. Um, 
Maybe they're expecting you to put tech cards in, which are very niche, um, but with the extra draws and with the extra mulligans, this shouldn't be um, an issue to work with. I don't know if you're in favor of that particular change. We, we had a long time when Clear Skies was difficult to use. When they've given this option of first light, it became actually pretty decent, for a time anyway, until Reconnaissance came in. Okay, so here we've got our first look at our gold card, Iris. She has the epic stone, so she's an epic gold card. So I would indicate she is a silver that's what got promoted and it's gonna be the same amount to craft. But she is a really good example of how two rows um, is improved, okay? So she has the ability on a melee row to destroy an artifact. We don't know what artifacts are, but we think they're something you equipped onto cards like Magic the Gathering, and that will give them abilities and stuff, but she can destroy that. And she has a ranged ability, clear all hazards from your side. And as you can see, um, melee means they can only be played on the melee row, or the ability is only triggered on the melee row, and the same for ranged. So she has two abilities. You can place her on the melee and do one, place her on the ranged and do the other. So one of the reasons they closed the gut the the rows into two was so they could balance things a little bit more interesting and make cards more interesting and she is a prime example of that now they did say they're having other cards which maybe have a melee ability but they're not row locked you can put them on the ranged row but they won't activate the ability and there's a multitude of strategy reasons why you don't want to do that maybe you have to play it into weather if you play it on melee maybe you have to uh, activate its ability but there's not really a consume target so you don't bother you don't have to hit something you don't want to um, maybe you don't want to play in, in into reach which we'll get on to later uh, play into range of something else so uh, or maybe you don't want to play into igni so you play it on a row and forfeit its ability so there's plenty of reasons why you know playing it on one row and forfeiting an ability is a way to go so she's a really good example of why two rows that they're trying to make unique is actually pretty cool. Now we can also see in the background of this particular image, we are in the deck builder. We've got the ore, the scrap, the meteorite powder and the kegs up there and all this kind of jazz. But in the background here, we can see the decks. Okay, so the decks are gonna be presented in the same way as they currently are, unless this is subject to change. Um, I think it's been confirmed that we're still gonna get the deck list in a vertical uh, list like we currently have. Um, this doesn't look particularly any longer and with bigger decks and less bronzes to stack onto one times two times three. It doesn't look like we're gonna actually be able to fit all cards. This is a big requested feature uh, that we can fit all cards on a particular screen. So one screenshot will will get the entire deck and it helps for people like streamers, if people wanna copy the decks and stuff. Um, so we can see that's gonna be established in the same sort of way. Now behind here, we can see some other cards, not too important really, but they do seem to be all gold cards and all neutral cards. Mitobraca, Heroquax, Siri Nova, Sihil, and I'm not sure what that is. People say it's um, Yennefer Sorcerer, I don't know, and there's Iris. Now over the right hand side here, it seems like we've got some filters. Things like the bronze, the silver, the gold, the epic, the rare, the legendary uh, filters here, and maybe some other things like typing. Okay, so this is where your filters probably go, uh, which is a little different to how it is now which is a bit weird because it seems like that'd be great if you could tab it in and out because then you get more space. Up here though, it seems like we've got a number five and a number six. And I know like in Hearthstone, there's mana one, two, three, four, and you can click on it and it'll only show you cards of that particular mana. And I think that's what's gonna happen here. This is five, this is six. If you click on six, it only shows you cards of strength six, which is really good when you know what power a card is and you can just Quickly. So it's really good for advanced deck builders that know the strength of pretty much all the cards in the, in the game. So here we've got, again, this is the great example of the UI where it's gone a lot darker. You've got crease, they're trying to make it look like cards and stuff. Again, these are obviously um, just uh, placeholders. We've also got card backs, which are gonna pop up now. Um, redesign card backs, it's been confirmed that we are getting multiple card backs, maybe cosmetic that you could buy or maybe you'll achieve them through the ranked system. Um, but these are some of the card backs now that you can see. So one of the highly requested features that we're gonna get here is that the fact that um, when you right click to zoom in on a card, we actually see the value it is, whether it's boosted or wounded or what, but also the base value of a card, which is a highly requested thing, but you have to right click it. What we do know is that at the moment, you don't get to see it when you hover over. 
hover over a card. There is no base strength here, uh, which maybe they could fit it in here or something. This is a requested feature. And um, as you can see from the UI, we are missing sections where cards would show up. And that's because they've gone for this floating tooltip style of card. So when we look at the abilities, we see the abilities, we see any tooltips like we saw with Iris, and then we saw any um, particular flavor text. Um, it'd be nice to get the artist of the card, uh, who made the card. Maybe that's only in the collection tab and ra rather not here. Who knows? Here we are back with the mulligan. We've got some more cards. We've got Imna of Sabbath. This is going to be the primary card to, again, reiterate the why two rows is a cool idea. Now, you could have done this with three rows, but I think the main reason they put it down was to um, make the rows unique. But he's got an order ability, you can see by the icon, once more, to damage a unit by two. And it's cooldown one, so I think he can use it every other turn. I'm not sure. Um, but he has a reach of two, and we're really going to get into that in a moment. So here we have a board, and they're going to use Imlaris cooldown ability. You can see it's activated. It says times one, and um, he's going to attack something for a damage of two. Now he has a reach of two, and basically what this means is that he can reach two two rows ahead of him. So he's on the back row, so he can reach one row there and one row there. You'll see he tried to activate this one and hit it, but he can't, so he hits this one instead. Okay, so this is what reach does. And remember, Geralt Igni down here also has a reach of two. So there's a lot of strategy involved in reaching um, particular rows. So this establishes the fact that rows can be quite important. You can defend certain cards by putting them on the range row further away so that they can't reach them if they've got a reach of one, for example. Or in this case, he's got a reactivatable ability. You can see it's gone into a cooldown. So next turn or the turn after, it will be off cooldown. If he placed him on the melee row, he would be able to keep hitting any units he wants. But if the opponent would to move him to the back row and then start stacking on the back, he would run out of targets. There's a little interplay there. And there's also other strategies that kind of establish the meta of melee rows are more dangerous and range rows are safer. Because of range and reach is an issue, you would say that anything placed on the melee row can always be hit with a reach of two at least or a reach of one from there. But anything put on that row is inherently safer if they don't have the reach for it. But if there's a full row or if there's weather there, you can protect it. They'd have to put their unit into weather in order to reach your back row. Okay, so there's a bit of a risk with the melee row, which is not there with the range row. And maybe there's some meta and established uh, strategy revolving around that. Now, one thing we can see soon in the next scene. So here we have Morvood. He's about to play. Now, basically, I'm going to explain how your turn works. And when it's your turn, you can do whatever you want. Okay, activate abilities and play a card or pass. They're your options. And if you play a card, you can't pass. Of course, you have to end the turn if you played a card. But after you played a card, your turn's not over. You have to press that button, which will appear here. And you can activate abilities before you play a card and after you play a card. So imagine great swords and light long ships, um, but you get to choose when they go off before you played the card or after you've played the card. It's totally up to you. And you'll see that. He can pass because he hasn't played a card. He hasn't activated his ability, but he'll play more Vood, which will do some extra VFX, which they're trying to really bump up. And now you can see it's changed to end turn, but it's not ended his turn yet. Okay, he can't pass now because he's played a card, of course. He can't play a card and pass. But he can either end his turn or he can activate some abilities if he wants to. Okay, So it'd be, it'd be in his right mind to do so because it cooldowns and it resets. But he doesn't because I think they're just showing it off. But this is how it works. Okay, So during your turn, activate as many abilities as you want that you've got access to. Play a card. One card per turn as usual. Activate any other abilities that you didn't activate before you played it. And then end your turn or activate any abilities you want and then pass, okay? And we also have it confirmed that there's no auto pass feature. So if I run out of cards, it's still my turn and I can still activate abilities and then I end my turn. If he's still playing cards and I haven't got any, it still comes back to me and I can play any, I can activate any abilities I want, okay? Which also solves any sort of Ockfist thing where it comes back to your hand after you've passed as well, which is really nice. But uh, what we do see is that when you lose or win, 
your leaders here will uh, taunt each other. Okay, as you can see, we saw the woodland spirit there point at the unseen elder and threaten him, and we saw the unseen elder dab, which is nice. Okay, so I think that's my entire commentary of the homecoming reveal trailer. Let me just see. I don't think I've mentioned they've done a lower average of bronzes, but the reason is because they don't want the game to be as swingy. Um, I don't think that makes much sense, so I'd like clarification on that myself, because if you do a 30-point swing with one gold in the current Gwent, then a 12-point swing with a gold is still the swing, the same swing, because, you know, it's comparatively, it's still better. Now, that's just my opinion. You may have a different opinion of why it's better to go lower. I don't know, it's easier for cards to align, so maybe Geralt Ligny is a bit better and Scorch is a bit better, which is not great either, so. And finally, we didn't talk about anything regarding coin flip, apart from that you get one or two more mulligans if you go first. There's nothing in this video about initiative, uh, which was a bit of a shame. I was really looking forward. That was the main thing that I want to talk about, is the coin flip and how they fixed it and stuff like that. And I really think that's tied to initiative. So... I'm not going to talk about that now because it wasn't in this reveal trailer. I think I went through everything that I could think of. Um, I mentioned the leaders follow your mouth or your wonders at least. Um, thank you very much for watching this half an hour video. Uh, I'll put some timestamps on it if I can. Thanks guys. If you've got any other requested videos, please let me know. I'm motivated to do loads. So uh, take care of yourself and I'll see you again very soon.